Oh, hey, what? Oh, is this your video? Do you have questions to ask? Please, please, no. Also, before we get started, also before we get, also, also before we get started, the reunion, our short film, The Reunion, is finally out. Welcome to Granny's house. If you're ever feeling a little down, you're ever in a little rut, you need to change the pace, go to Granny's house. Well, we did it. We hit the first milestone for the six shop, which was to get a thousand subscribers. I know, doesn't sound like much, but it is to us, and that's okay. And to celebrate, we're gonna do a Q&A. We put out some questions on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so that we can answer some of your filmmaking questions. Every q and I have ever seen, the person answering question probably says, it depends, 50 different times. I'm going to make the very safe assumption that you, sir or ma'am, might have some intelligence, and you might know that flexibility might be the only constant in filmmaking. I'm not making this video to give you everyone's answer, I'm here to give you mine. And hopefully it's a little direct, it's to the point, and it helps you make decisions in your filmmaking career down the road. So before you watch this video, I highly suggest to you to click the link in the description below and watch our newest short film, The Reunion, which by the way, it's a proof of concept for our first feature film. And in the coming weeks, we're gonna be doing some pretty intensive breakdowns of how we made that film. So watch it and get ready for the barrage of content. And this first question actually comes from a buddy of mine and he asked, should I consider film school? This is a fun one to answer after that disclaimer I just put, huh? No. I do know people that have gone to film school or have gone to film related programs and found a lot of success from it. But I've also found that many of my friends who are really making big strides in their careers learn by doing. And even me, my primary source of education for filmmaking was in fact YouTube. So you're going to ask yourself, is the price of something like film school going to be worth it to you in your career down the line? Because film school ain't cheap, man. I will say though, I have met people who wanted to be producers. They actually have nothing but positive feedback about going to a film school. So food for thought. How to easily color grade in Premiere. That sounds like a YouTube video on its own, but let me just tell you how I do it. I am not a colorist. I have fun coloring my footage, but I am not in depth with using DaVinci Resolve. I'm trying, I'm getting there. But at the end of the day, I have a go-to process that I enjoy, and it usually involves using Film Convert Nitrate. But to get my overall look, I really nowadays just rely on the fact that I have B-Raw on this Ursa Mini. Contrast, exposure, all that I can dial in so easily. And honestly, I can get most of my footage just from the raw settings alone. So from there, all I'm really doing is, you know, what kind of flavor am I putting on top of my footage? And if it needs a little boost, I'll go through my extensive library of LUTs to just add a little bit of pizzazz on an adjustment layer that covers the entire video so that my entire project has this kind of unified look to it rather than just putting one LUT for one shot. Are editors ever on set to give input? This one gets an absolute screaming, hell yes. If you as a director can have your editor on set, oh, please make that happen. After all, you may have heard the adage that your film is made three times, once in the writing, once in the filming, and once in the editing room. Editors have a ton of power, and for good reason. But there's a disconnect when you're just a director or a DP, you got all your shots, you text up your editor homie and you're like, hey man, footage is on the way, got a hard drive in the mail. And then they're just sifting through footage, trying to get an idea of what you were going through in the first place. Now, of course, you can communicate with your editor after the fact. If you really want your editor to be on the same page as you, God, please have them on set. It is so awesome to have an editor talking to the director about cut points and about how they could use certain shots in different ways. And it just gets those creative juices flowing. It gets ideas moving and it's just really practical. The more you can have comfort and synergy in the editing room, even before getting into it. Oh my God, that's worth its weight in gold. In fact, anyone you can get on your set, get them on there. The more the merrier, the more people that can actually see the process of the film happening, the better. Next up, 
in the film industry, do you need knowledge of all camera brands? Yes. And I don't say that as a gatekeeping thing, that you know, if you don't know how to use an RE menu or you don't know how to use RED or RED RAW that you can't make films, no. I'm saying it because it would only behoove you to know it. Whether you are starting your filmmaking career on DSLRs, iPhone cinematography, or whatever you can get your hands on, it doesn't hurt to learn the tools that you might be using down the road or in your future. Filmmaking usually works in plateaus. One minute you're filming a feature film on something like an old Lumix, next thing you know, you have an Aria Alexa Mini in your hands. If you're a DP, it goes without saying, you should probably learn these cameras. But also, if you're really anyone who works on a crew, it would probably help to learn these cameras as well. And you're not learning them because they're these big awesome things, they're the big bad toys. No, that's not why. You're learning it because you wanna be that asset that has both knowledge and skill. You don't wanna advertise yourself as an assistant camera, but you have no confidence or any idea how to work your way around, let's say, a Red Monstro or an RELF. It only takes a couple searches on YouTube or a couple articles on Reddit or some other Google searches to really get to know these cameras in a way that you can, that you can comfortably be around them. So obviously master the camera you have now, but make the time to educate yourself. Learn the cameras from all the brands because these are tools that are going to help us tell our stories. And you need to make sure you're picking the right tool to tell that story. Somebody said they would love to know how I film a scene. Well, I'm starting to lean more towards a coverage style of shooting a scene. I know the aesthetic I want, I know the blocking I want, and I know the movement of my characters that I want. So then I pick my A angle, I pick my B angle, and then I pick my master C angle, and those are the first ones I do. I make sure that I at least have those three shots in order to have the foundation of a scene. And for the A, the B, and the C, unless, you know, there's time and necessity dictates it, I will shoot the entire scene from those angles. I do get a little flexible with that rule though if I'm working with non-actors and I'll kind of break it up a bit so that they can better digest their lines and then me as the editor just, you know, we're just gonna have to live with that. And once I get my foundation, that's when we look at the scene, we ask ourselves, okay, what are the inserts or what are the, the D, the E and the F angles that we can get to enhance the storytelling? I will use the living room scene for the reunion as an example. We have our A angle, we had the B angle, both your you know, run of the mill handheld over the shoulder shots and then, okay, we saw the scene. And we knew that one point in the dialogue is pretty much an inciting moment for the character Kyle. So we changed the angle to something that would make you feel that. And then of course, when I do scenes that don't involve dialogue, I just have fun with it. I grab the camera and I just, I just feel out the moment. I have all this experience with handheld and doing these very guerrilla style intimate footage. So like the guitar scene, I was like, I'm gonna film this like I would a music video because I don't have to worry about sound. I can just make it look pretty and make it look immersive. Next is what is my setup for talking to the camera? It is debatably overkill, because right now I am doing a talking head YouTube video on a friggin' Ursa Mini Pro G2. And it's running into this NTG5 microphone directly from the camera, because daddy needs good audio. If I can get away with using internal audio into a camera, I'm, I'm gonna take that option. Normally for lensing, I'm using my Sigma lenses. You know, you can't be a YouTube filmmaker without owning a set of Sigmas. It's in the rule book. But for this video in particular, I'm actually using some new lenses I picked up, which are these cine modded fake anamorphic Soviet lenses. But for the most part, it's just the Ursa, whatever lens I feel like using, internal sound with the NTG5, and then the comfiest chair I can find. And as for lighting, I find a window and I just run with it. All right, next somebody asked, where do I get my VFX? And I'm assuming they're talking about um, uh, the like film transition stuff I do all the time. I am a Tropic Color junkie, specifically their film artifacts pack. And then a couple of their title kits, like the cinematic movie titles or the animated titles, yada, yada, yada. I still use some of my old Peter McKinnon motion assets. They're just nice, they're clean. Some of a little bit of edge if I'm looking for some edge. And I just, I've always loved using the projector, old filmy kind of transitions and scratches. I just think it's a really cool aesthetic. I'm not big on like, you know, the, the dubstepy kind of 
modern takes of, you know, titles and sequences. There's just a, you know, dare I say, a vibe to the tone that something like Film Artifacts gives to my transitions and my footage. I dig it, it's comforting. And last question, and this one's probably been a long time coming, but what is The Six Shop? Or rather, why'd you name it The Six Shop? I am currently serving in the US Army. I was originally in the Sigma Corps, radios, IT, all that jazz. Usually, that is, that is the six section or the six shop. You, know, you got your one, your two, your three, your four shop. Don't worry about the five shop. And then you got your six shop, which is what I was when I was overseas, when I served in brigade. Also, the other job I had with the military is obviously multimedia, which used to be a 25 Victor, which means it fell under the Signal Corps. So it's really the fact that both my jobs have fallen under the Signal Corps, and it's just a nice little homage to both those occupations I've had in my military service. But also, while serving in the Six Shop overseas, that's where this idea of a veteran-owned film company really came to be. And at the end of the day, we are filmmakers, and we are veterans, so there you go. That's why we're called the Six Shop. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, the children are playing. You are nuts. Thank you all for these questions. I liked them. I liked them a lot. I'm thinking 5,000 subscribers. We'll do this again. Yeah. So as per usual, thank you for supporting the Six Shop. You guys are amazing. You're wonderful. And I bet you're beautiful too. I bet you're all just great citizens with awesome credit scores. And of course, thank you so much again for getting this channel to 1,000 subscribers. Never thought I'd be ever saying that in anything. This has been Davis and my noisy dog, Raya, from the sex shop. And we'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.